LA Times The Envelope Roundtable is brought to you by the Apple TV Plus drama series, Pachinko, for your Emmy consideration in all eligible categories. From the Los Angeles Times, this is The Envelope Showrunners Roundtable. Our guest today, Quinta Brunson, explores the life of educators at an underfunded public school in the mockumentary sitcom, Abbott Elementary. Oh, I can't wait. Michelle King audaciously examines timely and provocative social issues in the legal drama, The Good Fight. Oh my God. Anne grapples with the mysteries of faith and science in the supernatural procedural, Evil. I took an ice axe. I went to a man's house and I killed him. Alex Kurtzman reimagines the 1976 David Bowie film, The Man Who Fell to Earth, as a contemporary science fiction series about an alien trying to save his home planet while helping to save ours. Nothing will ever be the same. Ashley Lyle tells the psychological horror and coming of age story of the survivors of a plane crash on Yellow Jackets. I take it you know why I'm here. And Kathy Shulman chronicles the private lives of three influential first ladies in American history, Eleanor Roosevelt, Betty Ford, and Michelle Obama in The First Lady. Oh, I see. I'm good enough to get him here, but not good enough to keep going. Welcome to The Envelope. We're here in the LA Times kitchen. My name is Yvonne Villarreal, and joining me today are five of the showrunners behind some of the most talked about shows this season. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Ashley and Quinta, your series, Yellow Jackets and Abbott Elementary, you know, just finished their seasons, and they were some of the most talked about shows. And I'm curious, like, when did you sort of realize that audiences were catching on, Quinta? When, um, for me, it was, uh, there were two main things. It was seeing online chatter in a, in a, in a very organic way. I think there is like, you know, modified online chatter that maybe your social page itself is starting, but there was just online engagement when I wasn't looking for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that started to happen after the premiere of our first episode. Ow, Miss Teagues, Andrew hit me. Andrew, apologize. One, two, three, four. So seeing just unsolicited engagement. And then it was when I took a trip to Universal Studios and it was after the, per the first episode's premiere and one of the operators at one of my favorite rides addressed me as the character on my show. Oh. And um, that was just so surreal. I hadn't had that experience. But she said, you're Janine. You're on the show I just watched this week. And I was like, yeah, I am. <laughs> and that was very um, jarring. So I would say those were the two ways I knew. What's your favorite the ride? The Despicable Me ride. I think I it's a joy. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a good story. It's a well-written <laughs> ride. <laughs> Ashley, what about you? It was very similar. It was it was seeing. So I, I think it happened a little bit um, later for us, and so for the first maybe month that we were airing, I was like on Twitter and um, searching our own hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> no shame. And no shame. you know, I, I just hashtag yellow jacket and see what people were saying. Yeah. And some people were talking about it, but you know, I'd have to go looking. And um, then Bart and I took a little mini vacation right after the holidays. And of course, I'm sitting by the pool on my phone. And he was like, get off your phone. Mm -hmm. This is very unhealthy for you. Mm -hmm. And um, But that was when it was kind of finding its way into my actual Twitter feed as mm -hmm. opposed to going out and looking for it. And mm -hmm. that, I remember I turned to him at one point. And I said, something's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, this is actually really cool. If you ever tell anyone what the two of you did, I will end you. I will gut you like a pig, and if they find your body, which they won't, it won't matter. 
And then he actually got me to put my phone away, and then um, one day he looked at his phone and he gasped. And that was, it was, um, so Stephen King had tweeted about our show, and I am wow. a diehard, yeah. absolute diehard Stephen King fan. I've read, I think, everything he's written. And um, and I cried. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And he took video of it, and uh, we now have a pact that he can show it if I die first at my funeral. Oh, this is fair. <laughs> Who is the viewer you imagine when developing a show, and has that changed from when you first started? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I love that question. I don't know. We pitch Michelle. everything to our daughter. Yeah. It, all, it sort of all starts That's and ends awesome. with her. So it, no one at CBS has heard a pitch that she hasn't heard first. Mm -hmm. And what kind of um, critic is she? In terms she's good. Of, yeah. Oh, she's very good. <laughs> How old is your daughter? She's 22 now. Okay. I love it. How did yeah. you pitch The Good Wife to her? What do you remember about that? Uh, I, you know, just the gen, I mean, we were obsessed with the stories mm -hmm. of the day anyways, so it was just, okay, this is how we're thinking of maybe it mm. becomes a show. Mm. Mm. What about you, Quinto? What do you think about when it comes to the viewer? Who do you imagine? Oh, so interesting. Also the same, but different. I think about my mom mm. and my dad. Uh, depends on the show also. For Abbott, which I knew wanted to go to network television, mm -hmm. I was thinking of <clears throat> the network television viewer, um, which is my, my mom and dad. And they're not critics, they just enjoy TV. Mm. And that's my favorite type of person. My mom and dad don't have much to say other than I'm having a good time or I'm not, and then they change the channel. Mm. But there's nothing else to be said, and like that's kind of my favorite <laughs> TV viewer. And um, but ultimately, I thought about family viewing. Like I thought, I think about the shows, the comedies that brought us together as a family, and that went to shows like King of Queens or um, Two Two Seven or The Fresh Prince. And I knew I wanted Abbott to fall in that place to be able to bring different generations together to watch TV, talk about TV. But but like I said, I think that changes from show to show. Like, I yeah. think you can create a show and you're like, oh no, I want this absolute niche that is none of that. But for Abbott specifically, I wanted like multi-generational What viewers. kind of feedback does mom give? Loves it. She, <laughs> she oh, says good. my favorite thing, which is this is good. That's it. And then, then that's, that's like the highest compliment from my mom. <laughs> Do they watch it more than yeah. once? Do they what? They do. They they Good. genuinely in, enjoy it, which I like. But my mom did tell me she would she would love it even if I wasn't in it and didn't make it. And I think that is the That's highest it. praise. You nailed yeah. it. Yeah. Do you feel like there's more allowance now for the build up? I feel like there was a period like in the early two thousands or mid two thousands where if a show was premiering and there wasn't like an audience right away, it got canceled after two episodes, mm -hmm. three episodes. Michelle, Alex, do you feel like there's time now to let the sort of build happen? I think the expectations are different for streaming than they yeah. were for network. So they expect those numbers to build yeah. as opposed to with network, they feel as though, wait a minute, if you didn't capture it by the second episode, yeah. goodbye. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think you're right, it has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, is that your? I totally, it, absolutely. Um, there's a sort of there's an assumption also that people are not going to watch your show on streaming until the whole thing has dropped mm -hmm. because they're going to want to binge it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now that's baked into the thinking about mm -hmm. how, when they're going to pick a show up or mm -hmm. what they're going to expect the numbers yeah. to be because mm -hmm. most people now kind of don't want to watch week to week. Casting is so crucial, like to the magic of a series and for audiences to sort of have something to grasp. Um, Kathy, you have like an insane <laughs> pool of talent with mm -hmm. the First Lady. Um, we have Happy Jillian day. Anderson, Michelle Happy Pfeiffer, Viola first. Davis. Talk about like what that was like sort of when you're dealing with real life notable figures, finding the person mm -hmm. that maybe doesn't necessarily has to be a spitting image but captures that resemblance, makes you think of them, like how hard was that? Well, you know, we really were focused on an energetic blend of the three of them. And I think that one thing when doing ensemble work like this, the key thing is to try to create a balance energetically so that you don't feel as an audience that you want to be with one versus the other. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. once we started with Viola, who is a really high intensity actor, obviously, you know, it was crucial that the other women had a similar kind of strength of presence. And so we started there and then we looked for the essence of the first lady mm -hmm. versus the physical appearance. And mm -hmm. that was a hard decision 
decision, particularly with Eleanor, because she was a six foot two large woman and we cast a five foot two tiny little wisp of a person in Gillian Anderson, but her energy was the same mm -hmm. as, as, as Eleanor's. She's, you know, neurotic and nerdy and workaholic and, and, and she, she does this really well. Well, good, so he's finally decided on my job in the administration. Yes, uh, First Lady. That's not a job, Louis. That's my circumstance. For Michelle Pfeiffer, she's simultaneously very strong and very brittle, which is unusual in, in any actress. And mm -hmm. we went straight for her for that reason, because Betty Ford was that as well. And, you know, with, with, with Viola, you know, the thing about Michelle Obama is it's, it's like all truth all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nobody who's more honest and, you know, just hardcore verite than Viola, you know? So, but it was incredible. You know, they didn't get to work together. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also going to be interesting because they weren't going to be able to see what the other person was doing because the only way to organize the show was to do it in blocks mm -hmm. um, so that each of them could work for three or four months as opposed to, you know, the entire time. And so they had this bizarre experience of working within their sort of 50 years and their story and then being blended later. Um, and so, you know, that was the hardest part, was trying to imagine as we were going, like, how are we going to blend this back together? And we, we started with one set of blended scripts, and then we re-blended everything back in editorial. You know, we had one director for all ten episodes. Yeah. So she, Susanna Beer, and she was able to kind of readjust on the basis of what happened energetically. Mm -hmm. Because it was really hard when they're not acting against one mm -hmm. another, you know? Right. So that was kind of the way we approached it. The sort of drawback of having characters based on real people is the viewer sometimes expects a carbon oh, yeah. copy. <laughs> and there was some talk about Viola's choices or mannerisms as Michelle Obama. Like what role does the showrunner have as opposed to say like a director in shaping sort of the performance of the actor? Like did you have a lot of discussions? Yes, there were a lot of discussions, and I'm, I'm going to say that each of the actresses approached it differently. I think for Viola, you know, not that I want to speak for her, but mm -hmm. she she did begin with a lot of the physical characterizations. She felt that it was really important to start with um, getting the sense of the physicality of the character and then find her own emotional, you know, root in it. So, yeah, there's a little difference between you and those other candidates, Barack. Just, um, I could be president of the United States. Can you, can you find it in yourself to be a little excited for me? Excuse me if I can't share in the excitement of my husband potentially being shot. It was the hardest character to play. I mean, Michelle Obama is, you know, enormously well-known and well-loved, and we all think we know everything about her. And, um, yeah, so we would talk a lot about, you know, approach. And the trick was to believe that anything that, 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 that she was saying or doing was similar to something she had actually said or done. Mm -hmm. That was kind of, you know, we're dealing with this balance, I guess, as historical fiction is tricky. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole big <laughs> ball of wax, you know, trying to figure out what you can do that, you know, breaks from um, historical record. Right. And it's where, that's where the conversations live with the actors, which is we were trying to do the interstitial things, the, the things between the big events, mm -hmm. and to shift the lens to a female and family point of view. So we had to imagine what must have happened between June 15th and July 30th. We know this public event happened and that public event happened. What must have been going on with that family in between? And then we would just try to apply the general behavior that these characters exhibited, or I should say these human beings, mm -hmm. See? Exhibit it over time and then apply it to the kind of behavior, you know, yeah. that the actors were going to, you know, take on. But it's a delicate balance and, you know, obviously very controversial all the time, you know, sure. whenever you're doing historical fiction. I mean, Ashley, so many people cannot get over the casting on Yellow Jackets. I mean, just in terms of the adults and then, you know, the younger characters playing them, how they matched up. What did you think of that? And then does that put sort of extra pressure as you start thinking about you know, um, casting for season two for the roles that we haven't, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me who's playing Lottie. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot reveal. <laughs> uh, we're, we're actually kind of early in that process mm -hmm. now. Um, we're really working on the story and the scripts right now. Mm -hmm. But it's, 
It's a tall order. Yeah. And oh my God, when we started casting the show, I think we were all very much just thinking, what have we done? <laughs> like, what have we done to ourselves? Um, it was similar in that we, we really decided pretty early on that we were going to think a little bit more about sort of an energetic um, mm -hmm. match and what was the essence of these actresses as opposed to trying to be really matchy-matchy with um, the physicality. And it, it worked better than we thought. I mean, there was a lot of holding up headshots side by side and mm. squinting at them and going, hey, we think that could work, <laughs> and I think so. Yes, we did a lot of that. Um, <laughs> So that was a huge part of the process, mm -hmm. and we just, you know, we um, felt very strongly that we wanted to um, be there in person for auditions. We, we cast it pre-COVID, so we were able to do that, and um, because we wanted to feel people's energy, and you just can't quite get that on self-tape. You know, we did cast a few people from self-tapes because they were just far afield. I mean, Ella, who plays... Um, Jackie mm -hmm. and Sophie Thatcher, who plays young Natalie, were both self-tapes and blew us wow. out of the water. I mean, I mm -hmm. think we, we saw three lines and we were like, cast this person immediately. Mm -hmm. But um, it, was, it was tricky and you know, it, it's interesting to me because one of the sort of matches that people really go nuts for is um, Melanie yeah. and Sophie Nalise, who plays Shauna. And that was a tricky one and Sophie is so incredibly talented for her age. It's yeah. just absolutely astounding to watch her work. But she's blonde and blue-eyed. And so <laughs> we were a little skeptical at first. We were just like, is that going to work? And you know, hair dye, I think for the pilot we just <laughs> we did spray in hair dye. She uh -huh. had another yeah. role that yeah. you know we didn't know if we were getting picked up to series, so she didn't want to dye her she's hair. Like, I'm not committing. Yeah. She's like, yet. I'm not doing yeah. that. Yeah. And um, and colored contacts. We have a lot of colored contacts happening on this show. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, and it helps, you know. Yeah, we and use colored contacts a lot, too, for the yeah. younger versions and mm -hmm. things. Really? Wow. I mean, I'll tell you what was hard. It was Barack and young, Bar young Barack. Mm -hmm. Hard enough to find Barack, let alone young Barack, mm -hmm. and make the match. That was, yeah, yes. same thing. It was just really hard. I don't know what else to say other than it was really hard and took a lot of work. So it's going to be really hard yes. season two. <laughs> yes. Well, and especially with someone like Lottie, because Courtney Eaton, who plays the younger version, is so unique and um is well twitter has given suggestions they have. They have. Oh, i know writer i'm well aware but Catherine zeta jones well i know but the thing is is that uh, i mean frankly uh, you know courtney is um her you know her, she's asian mm -hmm. and so twitter is suggesting a lot of white actresses so we're like you guys we're not going to be doing that <laughs> so you know, good to hear. yeah good no to hear. so you know we we've got some ideas and we'll see how it goes okay. <laughs> we're very excited alex something you've talked before about is one of the great things about being an artist is sort of making sense of the world around you and you and jenny lumet sort of began writing um, the sequel to The Man Who Fell to Earth in 2018, right? Yeah. So what were you trying to make sense of then, and how did that evolve to what we see on the screen today? Um, I think we were just looking around us and seeing how divided the world was becoming, and, and we were seeing that despite all of the connectivity of social media, it was amplifying our, our differences and it was separating people. And then the pandemic hit and it seemed to amplify it even more. Mm -hmm. And the world, it wasn't just that our country was so politically divided, it was that the world seemed to be fractioning. And, um, you know, I, there's a laundry list, several laundry lists of things that, that would happen on a daily basis that just would make our heads spin. And we just weren't understanding what, was, what we were seeing. And then during the pandemic, during George Floyd, when everything cracked wide open, everything that we had been writing about suddenly became, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's that it's that horrible moment when you've hit the zeitgeist actually in that in that circumstance, um, and so I think that for our show, we were we were trying to make sense of what we were seeing from the point of view of the ultimate outsider, the mm -hmm. the ultimate other who was coming in and in that sort of really wonderful way, recognizing from just a simple point of view, here's who you are and calling it out in ways that I think we have forgotten about often because there's just so much noise around the way we perceive things. What you're feeling, it's us. This is what we are, humans. I do not have time for this. 
And he sort of distills, Faraday, Chuatel's character, dis distills things down to sort of elemental simplicity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you, you asked earlier, like, who are, who's your audience? And the truth is, I think we were our audience mm. at that point. I think we, we were writing for ourselves. And that was the first time where we were really just writing for ourselves. Because, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, you're looking for the silver lining anywhere you can take it. And I think writing that show kept us sane mm -hmm. in that we were, we were just processing what we were seeing through the eyes of these characters mm -hmm. and um, and getting to do it with those extraordinary, extraordinary actors. Um, and I, I directed the first four. Getting to live inside of it in that way, I think, was a real uh, tonic for everybody, mm -hmm. you know? And we were one of the first productions back and I could feel from the crew, the cast and the crew, which everybody was so unified. It was an amazing, amazing shoot, mm -hmm. how much people needed to, to work on something that was talking about what we were experiencing mm -hmm. and oh, how cathartic God. it was for everybody to mm -hmm. do it. And I think for me now, you know, obviously we do this on Star Trek, but we didn't invent this on the Star Trek shows because Roddenberry did it. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of entertainment and social commentary do not have to be mutually exclusive, and it does not have to be eat your vegetables. In fact, the great gift, I think, of what we get to do is that we get to in influence many, many people with the work. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in, in a lot of ways, the, the entertaining them, making them laugh, is the best way for them to uh, reset and, and think about what's going on around them. Yeah. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back to the Envelope Showrunners Roundtable. I mean, Michelle, your, your shows are known, and you're known for sort of uh, infusing topical sort of um, stories in the shows. We, we've obviously seen it with The Good Fight, but even Evil had that storyline with like an as, uh, Amazon-like sort of corporation and yeah. unionizing. Um, I'm sort of curious, I've always been curious, like what's a day in the life of Michelle in terms of news intake mm -hmm. and how do you figure out mm -hmm. how do you figure out how that like how to translate that into effective drama well you know we I would say all the writers and Robert and I all just are reading and consuming news constantly mm -hmm. and so it's what is being talked about in the writers room and a lot of time you know one is stuck you're looking at a, a whiteboard that's empty and so you just start with okay what are we obsessed with what are mm -hmm. we upset about what are we fascinated by and you know it goes from there mm -hmm. but it's you know if you're stuck at a computer all day you've got to procrastinate and that's very easy with just reading <laughs> the internet article. That's what it's there for. <laughs> Did that moment where Diane, who's played by Christine Baranski, sort of has a sort of meltdown of I can't take the city, it's keeping me up all night. How much of that was sort of you living vicariously? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a, a particularly wonderful writer's room. They both are. But that we're very focused on the events of the day because the characters live in our universe, mm -hmm. our political universe. We don't mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. fake presidents and all the rest of it. Your unworthiness, which you don't seem to want to acknowledge, is that you can't be the top dog in a black firm. Wake up! To be back in the writer's room was like group therapy again. I mean, because it, it's just... It was very hard to take in the news during the pandemic when there was no writer's room mm -hmm. to process it and discuss it with, because they are so very smart. What about the notes from the audience? I mean, Ashley, <laughs> you know this all too well. The way that fans dissected me. each episode, <laughs> Every detail, probably details you weren't even thinking about. So what was your, like, what did you think of that? And how does that, too, make season two? Like, are you overthinking details now? We're trying really hard not to. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think the, 
the blessing in, in the first season was by the time we aired, we had already shot mm -hmm. everything. Same. Yeah. So you Same couldn't here. change right, it. Right. Yeah. You're gonna do it. It's so <laughs> freeing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so I'm like, freeing. this is what it is now. Right. Yeah. We'll never have that feeling again. <laughs> yeah. That was a blessing. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. And I will admit, I also, you know, went on the Reddit board a little bit. And it's wild. Mm -hmm. Just ab the theories, the, the level of, of detail that people were paying attention mm -hmm. to and really creative. I mean, some of mm -hmm. it was wildly off the mark, but still really creative mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, pretty early on in our careers, we, we learned that, um, and the first showrunner we worked for was Julie Pleck, mm -hmm. and she also is, you know, very familiar with having a very vocal and yeah. sort of rabid fan base. <laughs> and, you know, she taught us a lesson very early on, which is that there's a big difference between fan appreciation and fan service mm -hmm. Absolutely. and you really have to stay on one side of that mm -hmm. line because mm -hmm. you know people don't you know it, it's a great example is with romances in shows and in movies where people really want those mm -hmm. two characters to get together but as soon as you get them together you diffuse all of the tension and the story gets boring mm -hmm. and then you have no choice but to break them up at some mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. yeah. and so you know every the fact that they want something to happen is actually really valuable mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you should do it mm -hmm. or do it right Absolutely. away right and sometimes the anticipation is, is even better and so you know I think what we've done is we've we've tried to process you know how people were reacting to the show and then to some extent, put it aside mm -hmm. because, you know, when you asked before who, who are you making the show for, I think in this case in particular, we were kind of making it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very weird show, yeah. and <laughs> I'm still kind of amazed that, that people have responded the way that they have. And I think that, you know, we have a really, really fantastic writer's room. We have, um, you know, a lot of the writers are the same. We've really just added people this season. Mm -hmm. and. As long as we're enjoying it in the room and we like what we're doing, we have to, I think, just have faith that mm -hmm. hopefully that will translate and the audience will enjoy it as well. Um, so that's sort of our North Star, mm -hmm. is, is really the writers. Um, and hopefully the audience will like it, but you never know. Quinta, Abbott is set in a public school. It puts the spotlight on teachers. And this was inspired by the observations of your mother, who was also an educator, were there moments on, like, in the room or uh, shooting where it evoked some personal memories for you? Like, talk a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, when developing stories in the writer's room and breaking a story or finding what would be a compelling vehicle, everyone's just spitting out stuff. And I'll just go, oh, yeah, I remember. Actually, something that was interesting was I used to see my mother uh, spend her lunch break specifically with a, you know, one of those TV dinner meals. She didn't have time to eat, so it would be in her refrigerator. And so I remember going to the store with her so she'd get a bunch of those for the week. So it's like little moments like that that are unearthed where we're like, hmm. oh, all of these little things that are in the back of my brain um, that, that come up and are useful. Um, the majority of our writer's room actually went to public school or is mm -hmm. at least like one degree of separation away from an educator. Mm -hmm. It wasn't done that way on purpose, but when we hired writers, it was very important to me that I could feel the empathy mm -hmm. that the writer had for education. I didn't need them to know a teacher or um, you know any of that, but I needed to feel that they mm -hmm. had an empathetic feel toward education. And so naturally we had we have a bunch of writers who are just one degree of separation away wow. from a teacher. Yeah. And things come up from them all the time, just yeah. things we've seen from the brothers, sisters, moms, dad in our lives. But ultimately, you know, we're making a comedy and we're trying to make these situational moments um, yeah. the same way you would see in any sitcom. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot about in Friends when uh, I think Monica lost Rachel's, Rachel lost Monica's earring. Yes. So, Dumb, but I learned so much in that episode about everybody in that show and everything, and I think that's what sitcoms, mm. it should be a specific, you know, nothingness moment mm -hmm. where you can pull so much from, and that's kind of how we approach it at Abbott. It's a helpful teaching tool um, because these kids use these wands all the time. You're abandoning the phonics principle that these children need. This is a classroom, not a hoagie stand. Oh, boom, hoagie. Oh!
And so when we're starting from that little moment, all the rest is filled in. Our, you know, memories from our childhood, things we think are important and viable. And I think we may be one of the few rooms that, despite the current nature of the show, we're not pulling from headlines at all. Mm -hmm. We kind of all are actually staying away mm -hmm. from the news mm -hmm. and just going very inside this school. And we want to deal with the news the way these teachers do, which is almost not to because they have to teach these kids. That's what they have to do. Sure. Well, and that's what the, yeah. the, the sort of reaction from educators has been, right? Yeah. Like the way yeah. they, the moments are what stand out that reflect what they're going through. Absolutely, yeah. And um, that was what was so compelling to me about a sitcom like this was Maybe it was my react. No, the pandemic hadn't happened yet. Uh, but when I when this was thought of, but just having a world where people just have to, you know, one of our co-producers describes it. These are people who have to keep pushing a ball up a hill. Yeah. It does not matter what's happening. The hill might be on fire. Um, there may be a new president yeah. of the hill, and um, you know, the hill doesn't have student loan forgiveness, and yeah. now there's a pandemic. But either way, these are people who are continuously pushing this ball up this hill which is what teachers kept doing during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, everything else shutting down and they're still teaching online. They're, they're the and first to go back. still enthusiastic about enthusiastic. it. Still enthusiastic. And although the show was conceived before the pandemic, this mm -hmm. show wound up being a reflection of what sure. they were doing during mm -hmm. the pandemic, which was pushing that ball up the hill, mm -hmm. so yeah. Alex, the man who fell to earth is a sequel to the sort of cult classic mm -hmm. David Bowie film. What did you sort of like look to in terms of this is me getting it right like what did that look like for you when taking this on um i mean david bowie is so singular and impossible to uh in any way replicate mm -hmm. that we knew that the biggest mistake would be to um try to do that or if if the character of thomas newton was going to be in the show to uh have an actor who was going to be doing an impression of right. David Bowie because th that's just death. And I think that Jenny and I, he's just one of the bravest performers that you've ever seen, mm -hmm. you know, and what he did and the conversations that he inspired through generation after generation and the genius of the music um, is so specific that it's hard to even imagine that you could touch it, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we did was um, knowing that, that the character needed to be in the film, um, we said, okay, well, how are we going to make it different, right? But, and yet, how are we going to pay homage to? Which is, I think, to your question, that's, that's the juice of, of any time you're taking on something that's a beloved property, because mm -hmm. you're messing with people's childhoods, yeah. period. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you have to be super respectful. And the minute you're not um, sc scared of that kind of all the time, is the minute you probably shouldn't be doing it, because it's a tremendous responsibility. Mm -hmm. But you also have to remember that you get to claim ownership of that too if some if you love the thing as well mm -hmm. right and I, i've never done anything um that never, or at least i never endeavored into something that i didn't have a relationship to myself mm -hmm. first um and so i think that that if you look at his character in the film he's it's a brilliant performance and it's so singularly bowie but he's very passive yeah very passive he comes to the planet he's a wide-eyed mm -hmm. innocent he ends up getting corrupted by alcoholism. He gets betrayed by love, and he ends up blind, right? Mm -hmm. And he, but he doesn't. He's just trying to do a thing, and he can't do it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we decided was that, um, okay, it's 45 years later. Those things, what have, what has that metastasized into for him, yeah. right? Like the, what, what kind of rage would come up at that point? What kind of, you know, where does, where did the betrayal go to? What does 45 years of alcoholism do to you? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then suddenly we're like, oh, we're not writing the same character at mm -hmm. all. It's an entirely different person. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we kind of came to the idea that, okay, well, if Chiwetel, I his character Faraday, if he is somebody who it only knows how to follow start, a mission to and comes here blindly myself. believing that the person who was really his father figure is going to lead him down the right road only to discover that the person who brought him here is insane, mm -hmm. potentially, then you have the ultimate unreliable narrator. And now you're not in that territory at all. And you're telling a totally different story. And now the audience has to deal with the tension of like, wait a minute, he, he's here to do a thing. But what if the thing he's here to do is, is being delivered by a madman? We waited for you to return with water. Yeah. Long enough to watch the seas boil. 
But you never came. I got distracted. And so that just felt like we were now telling a totally different story. But then you get back to, okay, whoever's stepping into that role, no matter what you, however you decorate it, is still stepping into the shoes of David Bowie. Right. Mm -hmm. And that leads to like, well, only a legend can step into the shoes of a legend, and yeah. Bill Nye is a legend. And Bill knew Bowie a bit, and they grew up in the same neighborhood. Wow. Mm. Um, and so, and, so, yeah. and there, he, he, he gave me this very fascinating lesson. I'm so American, so I don't, but the, sort of the, there were the, the poor kids who made themselves look uh, sort of like wealthier and cooler, and then there were the wealthy kids who wanted to look more like mm -hmm. the poorer kids, mm -hmm. and that, um, he and Bowie sort of grew up in the poorer side of things. And so he was very, he, he understood the accent very uh -huh. specifically. Obedience is in your very marrow, not that you have any. <laughs> you always were the most obedient drone. You were like a Dickensian child on Christmas Day, an obedient drone following every directive to the letter. Well, here's a letter N. <laughs> And of course, we all know the accent. Yeah. We know the accent from how Bowie. Yeah. But he was doing his own thing, and yet his his voice, you can hear a little Bowie in there mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it was conscious for him. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, before I let you guys go, I feel like everyone's always asking me what I'm watching, and it's really hard, even though I write about TV, to keep up with everything. And I know for you guys, it's immensely harder than it is for me. <laughs> but what is the last show that really hooked you and like, why should I watch it? it? It doesn't have to be a new show, but like, what's a show you've come to recently that really sort of wowed you? I watch an obscene amount of television. It is, it's just my happy place. So I, I watch a little bit of something almost every night. Um, <laughs> I suppose I have two answers if I'm being honest. Um, the non-embarrassing answer is I, I loved Severance. Oh, um, I thought it was really great. And, and Bart and I had worked with um, Mark Friedman, who is an EP on it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've been in touch with him while they were, you know, in production and we're sort of eagerly anticipating it. And I, I just think it's wonderful. It's mm -hmm. weird and funny and dark and sinister and um, just so well done. It's, it's just beautiful. And that, oh my God, we were so angry at the cliffhanger ending, though. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no. Yeah. Oh. yeah that but was um, that was great. And then I've been watching a lot of 90 Day Fiance before the 90 Days. <laughs> and um, it just as a soci sociological um, experiment, it is fascinating. So fascinating. I can't stop. And those things are an hour and a half each, and they fly by. They fly, <laughs> they really do. It's, and I'm just endlessly fascinated. It's, you're really just watching a group of people um, ruin each other's lives in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I shouldn't enjoy it as much as I do, but then you, you root for them. Like, I get very attached. It um, might inspire couples. story. You just got to tell yourself that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sure, let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Alex? Ditto Severance, for sure, um, and Station Eleven. Um, I think part of what... Uh, Can I say real quick, for the longest yeah. time, I thought that was a Shonda Rhimes show. And, and so I, I, so all Station these... 19. Right. Station 19. Right. So a, a bunch of guys similar yeah. to you were like, yeah, Station Eleven is my And I was like, what is that? What? Not, that, not that you wouldn't be, but I was confused for a very long time. Yeah. So now every time I hear it, I'm cracking up, because yeah. it's just so funny. Yeah. You might like Station 19, we don't know. Yeah. I, I feel like Griffin's <laughs> loves Sexy firefighters. I do. I love them. Um, I think that that what those shows do, and there's actually quite a few like it, although they're, those those shows are very singular, is they really play around with the form, and they kind of, to me, typify the best of what streaming yeah. has to offer because they're just they're messing with narrative. They're messing with your relationship to what you think of the story needs to be, particularly in Station Eleven, not Nineteen Eleven. <laughs> Because uh, it, it shuffles the deck on time in a way, yeah. I mean, as you mm -hmm. certainly know, um, it shuffles the deck on time in a way that's very, there's something profound that happens when it works because mm -hmm. it gives you this perspective on what happens to people over time, over yeah. long periods of time, particularly in moments of trauma, mm -hmm. that I think is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm going to check it out. Mm -hmm. For me, I think the last show that really hooked me was The Righteous Gemstones oh, on same. HBO. Um, I'm a huge Danny McBride fan. I think he's just the funniest. He always 
gets me, <laughs> cracks me up. One of those people who I'd watch read the phone book because <laughs> he'd find a funny way to say mm -hmm. the name Johnson <laughs> or something. <laughs> and his writing, I always just found really inspiring as a comedy writer. I think mm -hmm. he's always going into a special small world mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and finding the magic and the meat in it. And he's done it yet again with mm -hmm. Righteous Gemstones. I think it's a fantastic comedy that without trying makes a huge comment on the mega church uh, mm -hmm. problem in America. Um, but it's just so funny and compelling. And as a person who doesn't like blood a lot, there's a lot yeah. in it. But if it's funny enough, I can get past it. And it is funny enough. Less I'm, wheezy. It's yeah. less wheezy. <laughs> I'm loving John Goodman, Goodman in a role like this. It's introduced me to new comedic, I cannot remember the name, but the woman who, who plays the daughter mm -hmm. of the family, just a comedic actress extraordinaire. She's mm. so funny. Um, I just absolutely adore it. It's mm -hmm. such a fun show to watch. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good pick. Michelle? So uh, this may be an obscure poll, but Abbott Elementary. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. oh my goodness! Uh, loving it, uh, loving it. It is, thank you so it is that good. It thank really you. is. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. It thank really you. Is. Wow. It really is. You don't say much, so I like that you still believe you. <laughs> yeah. No. What is it about it for you? Uh, well, I mean, the characters are fantastic, thank and you. and I, it warms my heart that it's on network too because it it appeals to everybody. It's telling yeah. the stories in a very true way. My dad was a public school teacher. I went through public school. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's it's very true without being the tiniest bit schmaltzy or preachy. It's, oh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank no, you. it's it's terrific. Thank you. I'm a network girl, too. You've killed network for a long time. <laughs> I don't think it's as easy as it yeah, looks. And it's, it's, really it's not hard. easy oh, to it's make hard. fantastic no, it's so procedurals. Hard. It's not easy work. And because it's the common denominator, people look at it as easier. But I know it's not. I know you're doing a fantastic job mm -hmm. with your shows. Kathy? Oh, gosh. Well, I, first of all, I just got back from living in Africa from se for seven months, so oh, I'm wow. har horribly behind um, <laughs> in terms of television. But what I'm, I'm sort of in a deep dive into the limited form that's character driven because I'm really trying to understand. You know, I have a, I think that, you know, going forward into other seasons of uh, First Ladies, you know, I don't get to play with suspense yeah. as mm. much as some other shows mm. can because mm. we kind of know where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And so I just watched We Crashed, mm. and I was pretty fascinated, I have to say, mm. and um, with the performances of both Anne Hathaway and Jared Leto and how completely character-driven. There was nothing but, really. Nothing but, it was yeah. nothing but the whole way through, and I was pretty amazed by, you know, kind of the pulse mm -hmm. of how that was sustained itself over the course of it. And so I've just been in, in that kind of deep dive, and I've just started Yellow Jackets, which mm -hmm. I mentioned before, yeah. so, yeah. and I'm obsessing, yeah. so I, I, I feel <laughs> like it's funny right, right here, <laughs> but it's like, it's, and it's the exact opposite, because it's all suspense. So, you know, and, but I'm, I'm in this, you know, trying to understand, like, if, if a character has to draw, you know, I'm just trying to, like, keep understanding like how much can character drive an audience mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we can't, you know, have an unexpected cliffhanger? I mean, there's only so much you can do with history, you know. Mm -hmm. and so. You know, and then you know, trying to rewatch The Crown and understand that as oh, well, yeah. but, um, mm -hmm. which I really love, and I never watched it carefully enough, and now I'm really seeing, wow, they're good. Yeah, they're, yeah, really, yeah. Good. they're really good. They're really, yeah. really good. They're really good. They know what they're doing, so I love it too. Well, you guys seem to know what you're doing too, and yeah. I want to thank you for this insightful conversation. I hope there's been time for you guys to maybe sort of think of shows together in the green room. Like, <laughs> we want to be the first place of it. <laughs> yeah. um, but thank you for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, for you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you, guys. We're here at The Envelope. If you want to check out more of our Emmy contender conversations, check out The Envelope magazine or latimes.com. Thanks. LA Times The Envelope Roundtable was brought to you by the Apple TV Plus drama series Pachinko for your Emmy consideration in all eligible categories. Mm -hmm.